Hello and uh, welcome to Cheshire Audio. Now, at long last, this is the um, the active sub video, so active subwoofer video. Um, not really particularly review this. This is just talking about how to integrate an active sub into a stereo system. Really, not not going to cover uh, AV because that's a, there's different criteria. Um, it's a very different thing with the AV, and I think the problem with active subs is an awful lot of them. I'd say you know more than probably more than 95% actually. Uh, aren't really designed to work with stereo at all um, because with with films you just want the big explosion the effect and it's it's all it's all about scale scale and lots of bass uh, music is different you need speed um, I mean if generally if somebody wants an active you know suggest adding a sub to a system I would say no don't do it don't, just don't, don't add a uh, don't add a sub into your system um, I think the main reason for that is a lot of people I think a lot of people, if they're not enjoying the system or there's something they don't like about it, they always they always come to the conclusion they need more bass. Um, it's almost across the board that, and it's it, even even with people who are quite sort of in, in, into the subject, they sort of you know they under, you know they know the hi-fi, they know they like the music and all that sort of thing, but they'll still blame lack of bass for lack of enjoyment. And it's not always the case. I mean, I think if you if you start to think that, I think it's there's things to look at, like we've done in previous videos. You need to look at your room and make sure there's no problems with the acoustics that's creating a lack of bass. Sometimes it isn't a lack of bass at all. It's purely the, the enjoyment isn't there. And I think if you're not engaged with the music, your mind starts to wander onto other things and you start to blame other things. Um, notice this, the first time I noticed this was when CD came out. Uh, and everybody rushed to buy CD players and it's the best thing in the world and this is, this is going to be fabulous. I'm going to throw records away. And they all bought CD players. And then the next time I saw them, no, camera's just gone off. Uh, the next time I saw them, they were sort of, oh, I need bigger speakers now. Uh, I need more. But this, this CD player is so good for my, in my system. It's way better than anything I've ever heard. Uh, but it's too, good for my, it's too good for my speakers. So I need bigger speakers now. I need more bass. Um, and it was because they weren't enjoying the sound of it. It was the CD, early CD was very sort of insipid and bland sounding. And there was no engagement again. Um, and because they weren't engaging, the the brain straight away seems to go to this system hasn't got enough bass. Let's put more bass into it. So it almost created the rise uh, in, in sort of a popularity of the floor standing speaker. I mean, previous to CD, everybody bought stand mounts. Um, yeah, strange how things work out, really. Um, so yeah, if you're if if that's the thing, if you're just trying to fix your system. I wouldn't just add a sub to it because there's probably something more fundamental going on. If you love your system and it sounds amazing and you want to try and just make it better, um, if you're very careful with subs, you can actually improve things a lot. I mean, probably the, I'm trying to think, I was thinking earlier on, uh, probably the best, in my sort of best sort of top five systems I've ever heard, three of them were using active subs. Um, I think one was Krell, big Krell system with two rel. Stadiums. That's going back a bit. So when the, when, well, that's the old Richard Richard Lord days when it was the, the stadium was the top range one. Um, but he had a big room. It was a really big room. And I've got a chap who's got Tom Evans and uh, some of his favourite clips. I think they are. And he's got two two Rel G2s, which is amazing. Um, and then I've got a chap who's got a name reference system, so 500, 555, and all, everything uh, with 808. Titans, so it's Kudos Titans, um, and he's using Sunfires, which I don't think you can get in the UK anymore. But that that's amazing. I used to used to sell Sunfire a long time ago, and they were really really small subs, but really effective. Um, there's not that many sub brands, I don't think, that, that really cater for stereo particularly. Um, I've already had a bit of a preemptive strike on the comments with of somebody's somebody saying, "I hope this isn't just going to be a rel advert." Um, to be honest. Um, I only actually sell Rel, um, and this is the one we're going to talk about. It's Rel T9, uh, T9X. It's called now, isn't it? Um, but that's not particularly for any, not any particular reason, other than they've got a great backup, really good range, and there's quite a lot of their models do work with with stereo quite well. Not all of them. Um, I mean, they admit it themselves. There's a few that just aren't designed for. For stereo, um, the chap who left a comment mentioned MJ. They, they, they do got some, some good stuff. Actually, I dealt with them a long time ago. Um, and some again, some of their stuff is fine with stereo. Um, I used to sell Velodyne 
which were phenomenal. Uh, although most of theirs were, I mean, they were a phenomenal thing, like I say, but they were, I don't think they're imported into the UK anymore, are they? Vel Velodyne was probably the best sub-brand I've ever dealt with. Um, but most of those was cinema-based, really, for big, big cinema. Um, I can't think of any other brands now. Um, I had a bit of vague dealings with SVS. Again, very cinema-orientated. Cinema um, was it BK? Around, but was it called, they called BK? Yeah, never quite got on with those. But yeah, there was, yeah, there's plenty out there. There's an awful lot of manufacturers who make speakers who do subs as well. There's uh, Monitor Audio do them. Um, I think Fine Audio have just produced one. Generally, speaker manufacturers' own subs tend not to be that great. I think it's um, it's a bit like other things in hi-fi. I think active subs are a bit of a black art, and I think there's only certain companies. And I think and Richard Lord of Rel kind of invented it. Um, people probably put me straight on that, but I think we pretty much invented the domestic active sub. I think it, it was something that was already in cinemas. Um, but yeah, the, for domestic, domestic active subs, Richard Lord of Rel, who, who kind of kind of brought attention to it. So anyway, I am waffling. Um, what I'm going to do is just show roughly how to set one up um, on a stereo system, uh, and then sort of a few pointers as to how to, to set everything. And where to position things because it's slightly different. It's a different thing uh, for stereo than it is for for cinema. So um, I'll turn the camera around and I'll uh, show you some of the things I've just talked about, which have completely gone out of my head already. So yeah, give me a second. Okay, so this is the the rear panel of the sub. Um, I could say Rel T9 X, which is a, this is just new in actually. Uh, I'm not going to go into massive detail about this because I'm just going to, just going to cover the, the areas that, that relate to stereo really. Um, got two controls here, um, higher high level, so that's basically, volume, basically like a volume control, simple as that really. And then we've got a crossover um, control. This, is, this sort of controls the point at which the, 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 the sub actually goes up, up to really. So this is the, the sort of roll off point for the, the top end of, of its output. So this is for sort of matching it into the speakers you've got. Um, where you set this to, I'll go into in a bit more detail in a second actually, because I think I'm, I'm feeling the need to draw a graph. I've never drawn a graph for, for things like this, so I need to, uh, I need to perhaps draw a graph. I mean, as you see, you can almost see on it, it's not actually particularly showing you any numbers on it. Some of, some of the rails actually have a digital display for this, but so you, you can go down to, I think, showing about 30 hertz, up to 120 hertz at the top. That figure is a bit misleading. Again, like I'll go into in a second, but it's, it's not something that's really. The numbers don't really actually mean a huge amount. Um, but yeah, like I said, I'll do. I, I shall do a graph, and then that'll make it even more confusing. Um, this one's just basically volume control. If you're using it with a, that's what they call an LFE, which is if you're using the output from a, an AV amp. So we're not we're not going to this. Um, and there's a various other inputs on here. That's um, that's your sub out from amplifier would connect into that. For stereo, really, I want to say it's the only way to do it, but the, the very best way to do it is to use. Oh, should have brought this a bit closer. Um, is to use the, the high level out, output input, should I say, uh, which uses a on rails uses this new trick plug uh, and some others I think actually, but basically that's just plugs into there. That twist, click. Uh, and on the other end, we've got three, three wires, confusingly. Um, now what you do with that is, and I'll just reset the camera. Okay, so on the back of the amplifier, um, so this is your, your speaker outputs. Um, so we have, at the other end of the new trick high level lead, we've got three wires. We've got red positive, left positive, and then a sort of random earth cable there um, and the best way to do it i mean there are slab sections it can be exceptions to this uh, so you take your right right positive put it into the right positive on the um, use the binding post I like that probably will put it in a bit further than that and then your left positive which on this one is over here so let's check that you're doing it the right way um, and then your spare earth just Either do it doesn't matter because it's just it'll go to ground anyway. So, so that's that. That's the connected, and then you then connect. Put that 
down it more neatly and then just connect any speakers behind. Um, now, if you haven't got these type of binding posts, which give you the options of spades or, I mean, the other thing you can do with these actually, I've, I've done this before for people, is to put a decent spade connector onto that wire. Uh, to, to gives you a better better connection, really. Uh, I, don't, I don't like bare wire, to be fair. Um, if you haven't got this type of connector, if it's just like, as somebody pointed out to me, exposure, haven't got these, they've just got the, the 4 mil socket, you can buy uh, stacking 4mm um, plugs, which I don't have any stock of actually, I should probably get some. So you'd um, connect your uh, high level cable into the stacking plug, plug it in and then plug in behind, or the other way around actually, you could, you could actually have your stacking plug on the, on the speaker cable, put that in first and then plug in behind with, with that with a, put a 4mm four, four onto, uh, onto the high level lead. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, yeah, I mean on this amp um, you can actually have actually got preamp out so you could actually run it off, off a line output. It doesn't work as well and now the reasons for that somebody might tell me in the comments. I don't know. I've I've tried it various ways with this and it never works as well off a preamp out. Uh, it works but it's somehow you get more uh, more dynamic, more sort of, I don't know, so just more integrated sound off the high level somehow. And all, all the high level does, it's um, it just takes a very high impedance signal. It sort of sneaks a bit of signal off the amplifier, so it's not as though you're connecting up another speaker. It's not the amplifier isn't driving the drive dry units as such. It's just sending a high level signal um, to the preamplifier internally, and then that, that that then sends a signal to a power amp, which then drives. So it, it's not this isn't trying to drive the big driver. So it's not as though the amplifier then is because with with amplifiers you don't really want to drive two pairs of speakers because they, 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 you have your impedance and it messes, messes them around. They don't like driving two pairs. But the sub, it isn't doing that with the sub. It's just taking, like I say, high, very, very high level impedance. The amp doesn't really know it's there. So that's it's quite a clever way of doing it. It does work quite well. Um, so what are we doing now? Um, I was going to say about... Oh, the, the slight quirk is, I believe, I've never, I don't sell any, but um, I believe if you've got an amplifier which is class D, which is, you know, the lot of modern amps now, uh, particularly AV actually, a lot of AV stuff, um, and a lot of very high spec amps have, you know, they'll have Bluetooth and you name it on there, they'll have a class D module as the amp section. Um, they don't need to have that, that attached. But I'd check your manual on that because that's this is something I've this is a bit of hearsay from me. It's not something I've ever actually had experience of. So I think generally you take that wire off. Apparently, if there's any sort of humming or whatever, you can you can, you can ground it. But I think check your manual on that because I think yeah, class class D stuff has got a bit of a mind of its own. Um, I'm not a great fan of it particularly. I know it can can sound quite good as it amplifies class D, but um, I've had a few problems with earlier failures on earlier models and it's, um, it sort of gets very complicated. So anyway, let's go off on a tangent. Um, okay, right, let's, let's look at how you would match and because um, that's not quite as straightforward as you'd imagine. So I'll turn the camera around and we'll draw some graphs. Okay, so this should be interesting. Let's see if I can actually draw and uh, hold the camera at the same time. Uh, I've drawn a, a basic graph. Um, what this this is sort of representing is an ideal world output from a, a pair of speakers, um, which isn't actually possible in physics, I don't think either. But anyway, um, so this this side is volume. Can it, actually, I can't even point that. This side is your volume. So the higher up here you go, the louder it is. And this is the frequency across the bottom here. So we've got basically from the deepest bass to the highest treble up here. So, the two I've marked, that is your pretty much the audible range for the human ear. Now, those two figures can be a little bit misleading because actually, uh, and this is the whole thing with subs, and super tweeters actually, which is the other thing. So your, sub, your subs will be sort of down this end, super tweeters up that end. Um, you may not actually be able to physically hear out of what they're doing, but you do sense it. And I think there's a certain element, particularly with super tweeters, where um, you're aware of harmonics and things sound more realistic because of the harmonics. So well, I'm not, I'm not, that's probably a, probably a subject for another video actually that one. But basically if you put, um, what I'm trying to show here is if you put a sort of 
a sweep of a signal, so from bass to treble, through a pair of speakers, it should draw a graph like that in the real world. Uh, in reality, and this is where things are going to go tragically wrong, because I'm going to try and draw this now, the output you'll probably get would be, uh, with a pair of ordinary pair of speakers, would probably be something like that, which would then start to taper off. I've tapered it too soon, but so ignore that. <laughs> ignore that side of it. Um, now, the big, I think the big mistake a lot of people make is they'll look at the, the, the pair of speakers and say, well, um, my speakers are starting to t my speakers are start uh, uh, showing as uh, going down to th going down to 30 hertz. So, okay. So what does that mean? Um, as you can see here, that line isn't actually even particularly flat. So, with well, the manufacturer, if they're trying to give you the actual frequency response of their, their speakers, what would they say? How would they judge this now? Because um, if you go by the flat line, then we're, it's kind of there and there. It's flat, sort of flat between, but not really. You'd, you'd be sort of pushing it if you're saying it was uh, flat between this. So let's let's say that's 120 hertz, uh, and that's probably I don't know about 10 10 kilohertz. Um, like I said, my graph drawing is a bit suspect. What they tend to do, they'll say 3 dB down or 6 dB down. So 3 dB down would probably, if you put a boundary. The boundary on 6 dB, 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 dB down. God, it's a tongue twist. It will probably be about there. So that gives that gives them a and and the same upwards as well. That gives them a bit of a a bit of a boundary, a bit of a get out really, because the because the, the actual output doesn't really follow that flat line. If you say 3 dB down, you can say well it's it's accurate between that point and that point. So our speakers. We'll now sort of say, I'm going to have to fiddle this a little bit, say 18 kilohertz, go up to 18 kilohertz, and they look, oh, look at this, they go down to 70 hertz. Um, some manufacturers would actually say, let's, well, let's talk about 6 dB down. So then they'll say, well, our speakers go, go to, well, it's going to be 19, 19 kilohertz. Am I, am I wrong? <laughs> you know what that says. Uh, and here would say, well, my speakers go down to 35 hertz because there you go. Look, but it's all the same signal. It's all the same output. Um, so, it, if you were going to sell, you know, if you if measure at 3 dB down and you're using 70 hertz as the reference point, setting your sub sub to that. Well, I don't know really. Um, which one's right, 35 or 70? You can't really go by this as a as a guide. Um, you need to sort of it's a bit of trial and error. Basically, you will you know set up and just see how it goes. Because what you're wanting to try and do is have a sub filling out and coming in and just giving you this extra this extra amount here. So is it there? And then again, we'll have marks of three dB down or sixty. But it, these things don't really matter. It's just a case you add it in. It, it sort of gives you an extra. Bit of uh, sort of extension. Right, yeah, I've uh, moved everything downstairs because it just uh, there's a bit more light down here, so a um, bit, bit easier to see things. Uh, I've done a new graph. Um, so this is showing again. We've got volume and frequency. Um, this line is a speaker. That's your normal sort of response per curve for a speaker. Nice and flat at the top, in theory. Uh, they never, they never actually, like I said, they never actually are. But that's the theory. And here's the sub in an ideal situation, perfectly matching the roll off there. So it just, as that starts to roll off, the sub takes over. And there's a bit of a crossover point here, which there is, there is actually on subs. There are, well, usually there's uh, what they call a phase switch, uh, so you can actually reverse, revert the phase, invert the phase. Um, that's something to experiment with actually, actually, because it means that anything in this area here, uh, if it's standard phase, uh, you get a sort of almost like a doubling effect. If it's 180 degrees out of phase, anything in that area is sort of cancelled out. So it's, it's almost like that curve will go like that and it just goes straight down, that curve will go like that and go straight down. 
it's difficult to say which sounds the best. Usually, I find that just a standard phase is best. I think um, inverse, inversing the phase can have strange effects um, to the acoustics in the room. And I, I'm, I'm a little bit susceptible to phasing, and it always sounds a little bit strange with the stereo. I think it's it's more more appropriate for a surround sound, really. Um, but anyway, let's get back to the, um, the controls. Other than that, the we've got the level control, a crossover control. So this is basically volume for the sub, very sim very simply. And this is the this is the, the point at which it it starts to tail off. So 30 hertz to 120. So you can adjust the point how high in the bass it goes. So on the graph, um, let's try and get the lid off my pen. So on the graph, the the, the volume control will affect this line here, so it will increase. So we can sort of get this effect as you turn up or turn down. Um, and the crossover point affects on there, would we'll take it further up that way or down further that way. That's just. <laughs> did that one wrong because I did the volume as well, but yeah, basically it's sort of basically your crossover is affecting the range that way, your volume is affecting the range of it that way. Um, that's very messy, but it's you, 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 you get it, hopefully getting what I mean with that. Um, the problem with subs generally in, in stereo systems is that subs aren't actually very good unless you spend a lot of money on one, they're not very good at timing. Um, they're, they're slow to react, they've got tend to have big drivers. Um, I mean, it's very easy in a system to, pr to produce bass. It's, it's one of the easiest things to produce. But to produce good bass is possibly one of the hardest things. So, and that, that is almost the root of a hi-fi system. If the, bass is, if the bass is slow and laborious and it drags down your rhythm and timing, you just get bored of music. Um, so this sort of idea of just slapping a, slapping a, sub, a sub into a system because you're not enjoying it so much. You can actually have a completely reverse effect. You get, you, you, you get oodles of bass, but don't enjoy your system anymore because it's the, the actual excitement has gone out of the music. Um, and you tend, the ideal scenario really is to have a pair of speakers that go down as far as possible and then just use the sub just to, you say your speakers are coming down here, and then just use the sub just to fill out that little bit of, you know, little extra octave down there. Um, and have the sub doing as, as little as possible. Uh, I mean, the ultimate, really, with stereo is to have two. And there's, I mean, there's reasons why two, two is better. It's partly that you can put, you can actually play, you'd have a left, a left sub and a right sub uh, and have them very close to your main speakers. So then time alignment and all this sort of thing um, is, is much much closer. Uh, it's just pretty important, very important stereo stuff is, is time alignment with speakers is, um, is crucial really for you know, the actual rhythm. Um, and they, they always seem to be much easier to, to actually integrate. If you've, if you've got two, it always seems much, much easier to actually integrate it to the, to the system. Um, what tends to go wrong is if, if you're trying you know, it's like the sub-sat sub systems where the speakers might roll off up here somewhere and then the sub is trying to is trying to drive that whole area um, so the main thing you're hearing is you know almost mid-band and bass that's slow and you know unresponsive your nice clear highs from your nice stereo speakers but the sub is, is doing all this down here and it's and it's just not keeping up with the rhythm properly um, like I say, if you spend enough on one, they, they will do it, but it almost gets sort of prohibitive. You see, it, it, it makes more sense to just get a pair of speakers that will produce as much as possible, you know, give you what you want. Um, but saying that, that a little extra bit that the sub can do, if you get it, if you do get everything right with the system, and then want that little bit extra from the sub, if you if you do it right, it's, it's, it does pay dividends. It's worth it is worth doing. It sounds as though I'm against, I'm sort of against it, but. I think it's just just a case of doing it right, really. Um, okay, hopefully that's cleared things up a little bit. Um, watching that clip back, I'm not so sure. But uh, if you have any more questions on this, just give me a call at the shop or, or email me. Um, I'm going to go back upstairs now um, to the bit I recorded earlier, which just trying to show on that where, how you position um, relative to speakers and the different pluses and minuses of, of where you can you, you can position things 
Um, subs are a difficult one, really. You almost need the perfect scenario. It's very difficult to integrate a single sub or multiple subs into a normal living room, for instance, really, because the, the, the criteria are quite, it's quite exacting how you have to do it. Um, so anyway, like I say, back upstairs, and I'll uh, I'll draw I'll draw another draw another drawing. Okay. Okay, uh, it's getting madder, isn't it? Um, okay, so this rep represents the perfect room. We've got to start from the perfect sort of situation, really, because that's the best way to sort of show what you're trying to achieve. So that's the size of your room, seating position. Um, usually, the best place to speak is roughly like that. So you're in the tri you know you've got the usual sort of triangle. Uh, now the the surround sound sort of AV boys would tell you best thing to do with a sub is to put it there um, and the reasons for that is the sub will then use this these two walls to reinforce the output almost acting a bit like a horn actually um, and it does work. If you can, what you tend to find is that you put it right in the corner. Sometimes, if you start to get a bit of a boom going on, you just sort of move move backwards and forwards within that space, and you can kind of tune tune it in or out quite well. Um, for stereo, I think it depends on how capable your setup is and how what you're trying to achieve yourself from it. Really, uh, certainly, bass quantity is easier to achieve in that sort of scenario. Um, to be honest, all the best set sets I've heard and all the best things I've set up myself, it's always been better if you've only got a single sub there, um, but twin subs, which really is what you, the way you should kind of go with it really, is one there and one there. And the reason for that is um, it's to do with sort of time alignment really. The you want the distances to all be equivalent right across. Because um, if your subs are in the corner here, the, the, there's actually, it might sound crazy, but there is a bit of a time delay between the main speakers and the sub. And the main problem with subs is that they, they are a bit slow to react. And this is the thing, if you buy a, if you buy a sub that's suitable for AV and wasn't really designed for stereo. They're, they're actually quite slow and lazy sounding, uh, and they, they drag the music down. If you actually put it in the corner, even the best stereo sub will sound like it's almost a step behind. You wouldn't have thought that sort of distance is going to make that sort of you know make an appreciable sort of issue really. But it, it does it does do that. It does sort of it doesn't sound as though it's integrating with with everything else. So I always tend to say centralise it or ultimately get yourself two subs put them next to the speakers now the other thing I was going to talk about here is like I said right at the beginning really you shouldn't be trying to fix your system by sticking subs in you should be trying to add to your system so generally you need to have a pair of speakers that are actually very capable bass wise for this to actually work in a sort of high, a mid to high end hi-fi system um, it needs to have pretty good bass extension and be pretty satisfactory in the bass already for the subs to actually work and not mess things up. Um, and like I said, I said right at the beginning, my general reaction to somebody saying should I add a sub to the system is no. But in this scenario, if you you know say your main speakers you know are more than capable of going down to 30 hertz, the sub will just give you that extra little bit at the bottom end, which just gives you this extra um, sort of scale to the sound more, you know, it sort of makes, you, makes the walls disappear. At the other end of the situation, if you, you know, if you've just got a little system and you're just, you know, you're just trying to add bass to it, then then fair enough. But it, once you get to the higher end stuff, it's it's more about um, keeping the rhythm and the timing going, and that's that can be what the sub messes about. It can really mess about with 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 the rhythm, the rhythm and timing. Um, so yeah, that's. I'm not sure this is totally clear in my views on this really. I'm like I said, I'm, I'm kind of against subs, but I think in the right situation they can make a system sound fantastic. Um, 
and it's like sort of going over what I've said already. Don't just buy one to try and fix a problem with the system because it's it's never never going to end well, really. Um, and I think cost-wise, I would. It's difficult to actually put a figure on it, but I think you almost need to have a sub which is kind of approaching this, the price of your spe your main speakers. Um, I mean, you can't. I mean, I the little rel start about three fifty. I think most, most manufacturers have things around three hundred, three fifty, four hundred. Um, they're not really that suitable in a, a decent sci-fi setup. Those really, they're not. But they, um, I suppose if you look, you are looking at sort of subsat because of a space problem. You know, if you've got space issues and you can only have tiny satellites, then possibly that's a that's a, a situation where you you could use it and it would be worthwhile. But um, if it's a serious sci-fi setup, then I wouldn't do it really. You need to be you need to be quite well up the price range. Um, so yeah, there you go. It's been a bit of a fragmented talk this one because it's actually quite a difficult, quite a difficult sort of thing to to uh, get over to people. Um, am I for subs or against subs? Well, mostly against, but in some certain situations for. Um, I haven't got one at home. Never, never, never used a sub at home particularly. Um, I do have quite. Actually, I have sold subs to people who you know, single subs. Um, where they've got the system connected to the TV and they'll just switch it on when they're watching a film and switch it off when they're listening to music. And I think that's that's fair enough. I think that's um that works quite well. I've got yeah, I've think about it now, I've got quite a few people who've done that. And that is probably the only situation where I might use one at, one, at, one at home myself, really. I mean my, my actual situation, my actual listening room wouldn't take I couldn't set up in the perfect scenario like that and have the subs by the speakers like many people. So suggesting it is a little bit frivolous really, but um If you've got a sort of dedicated listening room, that's kind of the only way you would do it. And I think that's the only way it probably would work as well. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Um, I've been, yeah, I've been sort of, this is probably the only one I've sort of thought about beforehand a little bit. And I don't know whether it's worked as well as some of the videos, but because um, I think I've, 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 not, I've not scripted it, obviously, but I have sort of thought of a few things, a few ways to show things. Like I say, not totally convinced that's worked well, but, um, Quick, yeah, comments below. Um, talk, let me know what you think. I mean, like I said, I don't do an awful lot of subs now because I just do the stereo stuff. And I know there is a big market out there for AV, and a lot of people will have the favourites and all this sort of thing. But um, I tend to stick with Rail partly because I used to do with Richard years ago, and I have a great respect for the company. Really, and I'm not saying that they're particularly better or worse than anybody else's. They're just um, yeah, just good range. So good, good backup, which is always important. So anyway, I'll leave it there. Um, thanks for watching. Um, don't forget to subscribe. Uh, should be doing the answers to the competition. Well, the draw for the competition soon. Um, I had an awful lot of awful lot of entries for that. Actually, I didn't expect it. I thought I might get four or five, but it's. Um, I think the morning I came in after lo after launching the, the actual video for it, I think there was about twenty in the inbox of, of right answers. So. Yeah, quite surprised, quite surprised at that. Really, quite um, um, some people sort of struggling with one of the answers, but um, yeah, interesting. So anyway, I'll sign off now, and I'll um, see you in a future video. Thank you very much.